Well, good morning. I typically have all of my information on that screen back there that you don't see, but that screen's not working, so I have to have it all right here now. You don't even know what goes on behind your head, but there's a lot going on back there, so especially the time. I have to know what time it is, so we're starting about a minute late today, but hey, good morning. Glad that you're here. We're coming into the Easter season, so I hope that you are thinking of people to invite to church, especially on Easter, and I hope that you'll start with... Uh, uh, good uh, Palm Sunday, which is uh, always a, a kind of a gateway to the, the Easter week. So we certainly want you to be mindful of that. So glad that you're here today and hope that you have come prepared to worship. Let's pray and we'll begin our service. Father, we come to you to worship. And Father, may our hearts and our minds be set on worship. May we focus for the next hour on worship. May every song that's sang, may every prayer that's prayed, may every verse that's read, every word that's spoken, be reverent and pleasing to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and risen Savior. Amen. number uh, 28, which is how we'll open our hymn to God be the glory, says the Lord has done great things for us and we were joyful. So this hymn is a little bit different. We're going to sing three verses and then when we sing that final chorus, which uh, you're familiar with, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, 
Sally will play a little bridge. That's probably where I will stand you up. And then we'll sing the chorus together as a modulation. So you just remain seated right now, and then we'll, uh, we'll begin worship.
Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Sunday, of course, there's several things, a dinner uh, and so forth, and we're also going to have a sunrise service, and I've asked Nevin Nagy, if you know Nevin, he's the pastor right across the street there, you're going to give a devotional that morning, so that's going to be fun. He's a beautiful guy, he's uh, just someone that, I, he's such a gentle a uh, caring man, and you'll enjoy that. So that will be uh, that Easter Sunday morning at 7.30. Yes, Tanya? Yes, it's going to be at 7.30. Hey, that's okay. We didn't put it in the bulletin. I apologize for that, but I appreciate us emphasizing that. So, wow, we get to pray together. Let's pray, okay? Let's pray. Father, even as I said to you earlier today, um, I would much rather uh, stumble over my words to you and, uh, than to have an eloquent prayer. Um, I, uh, I thank you that you opened the door that we could pray and not only, not only pray, but, uh, but, but, but know that you're listening. Um, and it has nothing to do with our goodness. It has everything to do with the goodness of Christ. We thank you for him today. Father, I thank you for this church. You started it. You established it. We want, we want you to do a marvelous work in us. In fact, in fact, such a marvelous work that we are surprised by it in each of our lives, that, uh, that, that when it's all said and done, it is Jesus that is seen. Um, we need you. We want you. And I thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Dark is not 
Welcome to the Lord's table. Um, memory is such a marvelous thing, isn't it? Uh, such a sweet, uh, such a sweet experience in most cases. Um, he wants us to remember. He doesn't want us to forget. Um, even earlier on in the scriptures, when they would, when they had uh, overcome the Egyptians, they had put down stones to remember what God had done for them. My brother had a tumor. He had a glioma blastoma. And uh, he knew that his memory was going to go. And I got to, his wife got to walk with him through it, but I also got to share in that quite a bit. And he, and he just, his prayer was that he wouldn't forget the scriptures, that he wouldn't forget his family, and he wouldn't forget that he loved God. And God heard all those prayers for him. And may we never forget what Jesus did for us that day. And so we celebrate in the most reverent way the sacrifice of our great God. I am thankful that God took away our sin. He hated the sin, and he wanted it gone. There was one way to do it. Amen. <laughs>
I'll stay in. coming up and all of the events that go with it. We hope that you'll come and be a part of all of these events in person. We would love to see your smiling faces here in our sanctuary. Let me also say thank you to our elders and deacons. You know, some of the elders and deacons have to do two services. So they come early and then they stick around and then they have another service. So I want to thank them for their dedication in doing that because I know that that can be a commitment. So uh, very thankful for that. The choir is about to sing a piece that was pretty popular in the 80s. It's been a popular song, but Steve Green, if many of you remember Steve Green, made this song popular. People need the Lord. In this piece, the second verse says, We are called to take his light into a world where wrong seems right. What could be too great a cost in sharing life with one who's lost? Through his love, our hearts can feel all the grief they bear. And here's the main part. They must hear the words of life. Only we can share. We're called to take the word of Christ beyond these walls. And we need to do that with whomever we're in contact with. A neighbor, a co-worker, family member, whoever. That's our calling. We can all be ministers. It's not just Don's place to be the overall minister. When we leave here, we need to take the word and let others hear it. And that's the calling. Let me ask you this. How many of you think the world needs to hear the word of God? I mean, is there... I don't get a lot of amens, but I bet if we were one of those amening churches, one of those holiness churches, I bet I would have just gotten a huge amen right there. The world is just kind of messed up. It seems to be getting worse on a daily basis. The only thing that's going to make a difference is the word of Christ. We are called to take his light to a world where wrong seems right. <laughs>
again, and I'm excited to be here. I'm enjoying the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, we find in the first chapter that God speaks. That God speaks. He calls. He calls us to himself. He calls us into fellowship with His Son. There's an experience there. And I don't know about you, but I have a great desire to be in His presence. And I don't mean just in heaven, because I know that heaven... Is, is experienced here to a great degree. The Bible says there's a mystery that Christ in you, the hope of glory. God's intention is, is to reveal himself. God's intention is to fellowship with you and, and for you to become you to come to know him. That's why he gave us this word. I love Jeremiah 33, 3. Many of you are familiar with it. Call unto me, and I will show unto you great and mighty things which you did not know. God's intention is, is to reveal himself. I don't know if you've ever experienced the, 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 the sense of the holiness of God. Or you've experienced the sense of the mercy of God. I'm not talking about just in words. I'm talking about, about actually experiencing that to some degree where it humbles you because God's intention is for us to walk in humility before him. His intention is, as the Bible says in Isaiah 43, that, that we were created for his glory. We were created for his glory, so we know our purpose. We know our primary purpose of existence is to bring him glory. I've heard many people say, well, it sounds kind of arrogant. It sounds like he's got an ego problem. I've had many people say those things. Well, the only reason why they would say those things is because they don't know him. They don't realize how great he is. Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm 140, I believe, it's right around there. I read it recently. It says that, that, that God's greatness is beyond understanding. And God wants you to know him. He wants us to know him. The passage here that we're about to read, the maybe, maybe the core verse in this section we're going to read is verse 14, which says the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually unable. He says in the same passage that had those rulers, those 
uh, those men that thought they knew it all, had they known who he was, they wouldn't have crucified him. They didn't know. Because it is the Spirit of God that reveals to us the greatness of God. You see, there are, throughout the scriptures, there is a, a display of the character of God. His faithfulness, for example. I don't know if you've ever been overwhelmed by the faithfulness of God to us, but I have. Have you ever experienced, as I mentioned a moment ago, have you experienced not only the mercy of God, but the love of God? The love. Because what these things will do as you come to know them, they will bring humility to you and they will renew a desire to bring glory to him. You see, the Bible says that God is jealous. He's the only one that has the right to be jealous. Do you know why he's the only one? Because he says it over and over again. For example, in the book of Isaiah, he says, what can you compare to me? I mean, he is so great. What are you doing over there? What do you care about that for? Why do you love that sin so much? Why does that take priority over me? So he's a jealous God. Makes sense to me. I want to read this passage and what we're going to see beginning in verse 6. Um, again, is that um, God doesn't need eloquence in prayers. By the way, I like it when uh, people read their prayers. I'll tell you why I like it when people read their prayers. It's my opinion. It's just my opinion. The reason why I like it is because they thought about it. I like that. But I want to be one of those that I want to just say what's on the heart, and that's what those do. Um, what we see here is that man is unable to do anything for God without God. We know that God blesses us with the desire to please Him. And then He brings us opportunity to please Him. And then He blesses us for pleasing Him. <laughs> I want you to see this where it's really a great place for you and I to come to admit, to admit that we need him. I need you, God. You see, it, it goes even further than that. I mean, there's, it, it, I, mean I, I don't have the time to explain, express it all right now, but for example, you are in love for God, which I believe that you love him, that you adore him, and you, you're proud of him. And, but quite frankly, your love for him didn't begin with you. It began with him. First John says, you love me because I first loved you. You see? So let's read this and then we'll look at my point. Uh, it's not really a point, but we'll read it together anyway. But this is the most important part right here. First Corinthians 2 beginning in verse 6. Because he's been talking about the power of God in our lives. Verse 6 says, however we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Let me just pause there for just a moment. I have to tell you 
that there are people who really believe that they are great people, that they are really important people in the world, and they really do have a lot of power. There really are those people out there, and you guys know we can name names of those that those rulers out there, but they really are going to come to nothing. Now listen, can I say this? I'm not glad about that. It doesn't make me happy that they're going to come to nothing. What we find, though, is God is, is, is letting you know how great He is, and what He has to say is greater than any wisdom that we can find on this earth. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the angels before the ages for our glory, for our good, for our ultimate glorification. Before anything was made. Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has re revealed them to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And so what is he saying? Some, many people have interpreted this and say, well, that's talking about heaven. No, 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 it's not talking about heaven. The things that God has prepared for you right now. The fact that God has given you so many promises for us to live in such a way that's different than the rest of the world. That he came to reveal himself. That you can't get on your own. You can't get it because of your, your abilities. It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what he says and what he does. Verse 10 again. But God has revealed them to us through Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Verse 11. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? In other words, I know what my thoughts are. I know my motives. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. And so I can't figure, I can't, Listen, there's a lot of religions out there, and I frankly did not go searching all of those religions, and I think it would be a terrible waste of time since God has revealed to you the one man that can get us to the Father, which is Jesus. He said, nobody comes to the Father but through me. Why would you go searching other religions? You if you feel like that's what you need to do, then do so. But the truth is Christ. The truth is Christ. He is the wisdom of God for us. And so let's go ahead and look at this if we could. Would you, well, look, yeah, let me come back to uh, verse 12 in a moment. Uh, let's look at these two things. Thank you, Grant. Um, His wisdom was before the ages. We've already read this. I'm just kind of paraphrasing. If the wise of the world crucified Christ, it is because they missed who he is. It is only the Holy Spirit who can reveal the truth of God without any genius of men. The natural man cannot receive any truth from God because they are spiritually unable. But we have been given the mind of Christ because we have the Holy Spirit and because we have the Scriptures. Let's read this next thing. The chief end of teaching then is to point people to the excellence of God in Christ 
as the Son of God who created mankind and the universe in order that we might become enthralled with him and enjoy him more than life itself. And what I wrote there at the end was that's impossible for a man to do. Impossible. God uses words with these 26 letters. He uses it. But for your heart to be able to comprehend, it is going to take the Holy Spirit. And therefore, once again, God is trying to rid you and me of arrogance, of pride. Rid us of it so that we would walk humbly with him. We would walk humbly, and we would desire then to give him glory. You see? That's what it says, for example, it says in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 20, uh, 1, 31, it says it in 29, I'll read verse 29 also, it says, that no flesh should glory in his presence, verse 31, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. God's intention is for you and I to walk humbly before our God. And we discover that, and that becomes a part of us when we realize how great He is. And we realize how much He's done for us. He's the one who keeps calling me. He's the one that keeps drawing me to Him. He's the one who does this. The reason why I love Him is because He loved me first. You see, what I would, what I, I would use this term, I've heard it before, don't know where I heard it, I, not, I, can't, I have no claim to this. The, the, the phrase that I've heard before is, it's called expository exaltation. What does that mean? Expository means going verse by verse through the scriptures and exalt him. We're finally going to figure out how awesome he is as we exalt him in the scriptures and not man. And not man. Man is not exalted in the scriptures. God is exalted. So, so when you have somebody who's, who's like, well, God seems kind of arrogant. You know, he wants all this glory. Well, that's because we haven't come to this, this great understanding of how much marvelous he is, and how merciful he is, and how kind he is, and how faithful he is, and how holy he is, and how powerful he is, and, and, and we could go on and on about the very character of God. Let me, let me illustrate it this way, and I won't be long. Yeah, I won't be long. Let me illustrate it, okay? This is pretty important. Uh, this is the consistency of the Bible. The Bible is just consistent, ladies and gentlemen. It's just simply consistent. It's just consistent. It shows these truths over and over again from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God is the revealer of truth. Before I give you that illustration, I want to read a simple verse. God is going to call Israel back to himself. God is going to call Israel back to himself. And Ezekiel talks about this. This is what he says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. This is in Ezekiel 36. And I will take the heart of stone out of you, out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. I don't know about you, but as I get older, I don't want to become harder. I want to become far more sensitive to him and to the people around me. Don't you? 
He's the one that's going to take the stone out. He's the one who's going to put a heart of flesh. He's the one who's going to give you his spirit. It's what he does. You cannot create it on your own. You cannot create it. So let me illustrate it with this, and we'll try to close. Second Kings chapter 6 and 7, there's a story about Elisha. Elisha was at one time the, 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 uh, uh, the learner, the disciple of Elijah. Remember, Elijah was the one that went up in a fiery furnace. A fiery furnace? He went up in a fiery chariot. God took him. He didn't die. Elisha had seen all the things that Elijah had done. And, well, he had, he had certain experiences that were pretty amazing. And so what I want you to see is God being the revealer and everything that God says comes true. Everything that God says comes true. So whenever you hear a preacher out there making some kind of prediction and it doesn't come true, you know that he's a false, he's, he's a false teacher. Or at least he was false in that scenario. He was false. God is very serious about the prophets being accurate. So what happened was, for example, uh, we had this guy named Naaman who was, a, who was a, basically a general in, in the Syrian army. And he had leprosy. And God actually was blessing Naaman. And... Uh, he wanted to know how he could be healed of leprosy. And so they, uh, someone came to him and said, listen, there's a man named Elisha that can, that can do this for you. He can, he can bring healing to you. And he was quite an important man. And he came to Elisha's home. And Elisha sent a messenger out and he said, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. By the way, it wasn't necessarily a very clean place. And there were other rivers and places in Syria that were much nicer. And so when the servant went out and told him what to do, he got mad. No, he got mad because Elisha didn't even come out and see him. What is this? He didn't come and talk to me. He got mad and he left. One of his own servants came running up to him and says, Look, Naaman, you've got to stop. If he would have told you to do something easier or done something prettier or whatever, you would have done it. He talked him into doing it. So he went and he dipped himself seven times. Seven is a number for perfection. He went and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan River. He came out and his skin was like baby skin. That's the way God does stuff. His change is real. And, and so what Elijah said came about exactly what he said was going to do, the exact number of times that he was going to do it. Another time, uh, uh, Eli Elisha, uh, one of his prophets that were following him and listening to him, were disciples of Elijah, one of them dropped a, an axe head in the water and, 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 and it was a borrowed axe head and and uh, Elisha came over and said, where'd you drop it? And he showed him, he said, he dropped a stick in it, and, 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 the, and, and the axe head floated to the top, and he got it. And he didn't get in trouble, nor did he have to pay for that axe head. And it goes on and on. There's just these stories. I'm going to get to the point here in just a moment. I, I, you'll see what I'm trying to say. Israel was being attacked by Syria. And it just so happened that God would tell Elisha what... Uh, Syria was going to do, and then he would tell uh, he would tell the king, "Hey, he would king of Israel said, listen, uh, Syria is about to do this, and he would do this over and over." And finally, the king of Syria said, "Who is it? In my and, 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 and all these people around me are telling the is, uh, uh, Israel's king what I'm going to do next." And one of them said, no, it's nobody here, sir. It's Elisha. Elisha is telling, he, he's telling the king himself because he knows, because he's listening to God. 
And the king of Syria said, I want, I want his head. And so they went, an army, they said, well, where is he? He's in Dothan, not Dothan, Alabama, but he's in Dothan. And they said, they said uh, uh, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to kill him there. And they took all of these armies, and they were all around Dothan. And one, of the, one of the servants of Elisha had gone out early that morning. He went out there, and he saw all of those armies. He came back, and Elisha said, man, we've got a problem here. They, the armies are out there. And Elisha just simply said, God, show me. You know what happened? He saw all the angels that were guarding. God caused the blindness to come upon, upon the Syrian armies. And through a series of events, the bottom line is, is that everything, you can read in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7, Every, listen, everything that Elijah said was exactly happened. This book right here, right here, everything that's in here, it's going to happen just like he said. And there are so many people, even at the time of Christ, that missed him. There are so many people, when God delivered Israel from Egypt, which was a massive miracle, he did it. God did it. Everything in here is going to come to pass. He said, heaven and earth is going to pass away. But my word will endure forever. My word will endure forever. This morning, I want you to know that there are miracles happening all the time. All the time. And you know what the greatest miracle is? Is God is revealing his son. He's revealing his son. People are learning more and more about him. Not because of you know, these super intelligent people. Who cares? He's revealing him by the Holy Spirit. You and I need to admit and say, God, I cannot do this without you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this church. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who reveals. I thank you that you open up the word. You allow us to see who you are. Bless your name and your name alone. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. It's a really, really good place to be when we admit that we need Him. And a really good place to be when we desire to give Him glory. Stand with us, please. Would you stand? God has spoken. Love to pray with you. In number 554, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long, so I long for you, God.
a good week. If you can make it Wednesday night, we hope that you'll be here. And if not, next Sunday for Palm Sunday. Anything needs to be mentioned? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. You are worthy of our worship. Father, for next Sunday, for Palm Sunday, we will worship just as Jesus was praised as he came into the city. And it was a triumphal entry. We'll honor that, Father, as the scripture says. But we'll also be mindful of what was to follow later that week. His crucifixion. Now, Father, go with us. Keep us all safe and bring us all back together. And we ask you to bless each family that's here. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.